everything I've said is about how plasticity can be used to improve things. But on the other hand, depending on how you use your brain, plasticity can cause all sorts of problems. Hi, I'm Taylor Owen, and this is Big Tech. Humans have long used metaphors to try and understand and describe the brain. This led us to imagine it as an electrical machine, and then later as a computer. In both, the brain is a fixed object, hardwired, a non-regenerative organ. And this led to a type of determinism. But thanks to the work of people like psychiatrist Norman Doidge, author of The Brain That Changes Itself and The Brain's Way of Healing, we now know more about neuroplasticity, that the brain is far more malleable, how it has the potential to restructure and even repair itself, and how unlike a computer or any type of machine, it actually is. Neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change and its vulnerability to context, is an important advance in the field of neuroscience. But there's a dark side to neuroplasticity too something Norman Doidge calls the plastic paradox, that the brain's ability to adapt to experiences makes it vulnerable to many kinds of influences, not just the positive ones. And arguably an influence profoundly affecting our brain today is technology. My conversation with Norman Doidge is partly about how our brain is changing in response to digital technologies. It's also about what he thinks are the social and societal implications of these changes to our brains. He's definitely not a tech optimist. And while I don't necessarily agree with all of his interpretations of these changes, as we barrel towards efforts to build artificial intelligence and ways of reading and hacking the brain, we would be wise to move beyond our old notions of the brain as a machine. Here's my conversation with Norman Deutsch. As, as you know, we mostly talk in this show about um, digital technologies and the way they're shaping our societies and our behavior and our politics. Um, but an increasing area of concern in this conversation is the effect that technologies are having on our brain and the way we think. Um, And so I'm really excited to talk to you about all the different ways in which these technologies we interface with um, are are affecting the way our brain works, frankly. Um, But I I want to start with a a metaphor that you you argue, I think, persuasively um, we've been getting wrong, which is the, the brain as a machine as a big, complex, admittedly, computer um, that in theory is something we can understand like we understand a computer, inputs and outputs, and something that happens in between those two things. Um, what, why do you think that metaphor is wrong, or, or what's it missing? How about being alive, um, <laughs> for starters, as the <laughs> okay. key thing that it's missing? Um, look, it's best understood historically if you go back to someone like Descartes, who had a lot to say about many things, he, and actually was a scientist in his own right in terms of the visual system and optics and so on, he gave this famous portrait of the brain as like a a kind of a plumbing machine. And if if in a famous picture, uh, a child or a man or a boy has got his foot near a fire or, and it sends... Uh, some kind of currents up these hollow vessels, which are nerves, to the brain, and then it bounces back and causes him to move his foot away from the fire. So he was describing reflexes, and this was the beginning of this long romance between people trying to explain the brain with machines or machine metaphors. Or as machine, yeah. Yeah, as machines. Yeah. Um, You know... It starts off where you say the brain is like a machine, which is a simile, but if you listen to how most or many neuroscientists, I would say most, talk, it's they forget that it's a simile and speak about it as a metaphor. Mm. So, you know, when electricity was discovered and found to be relevant to nerve functioning, we started to describe it as an electrical machine. Mm. 
And when computers became the most impressive machines around, we started talking about it like a computer. But computers don't really rewire themselves the way brains do, uh, at least not our current computers. And there's just so many things that are wrong or inept about that metaphor. Uh, but fundamentally, you're more like a plant. Uh, uh, your brain is more like a plant or another living thing than it is like a machine. And machines don't grow new parts when they're damaged, and they fundamentally don't reorganize themselves, whereas the brain is doing certain fundamental kinds of reorganization at microscopic levels uh, with everything you learn and do. And in, in my area, in, in psychiatry, but also in, in, in neurology, you know, this idea of the brain as a machine meant that if it had all sorts of consequences clinically, it meant that if you were born a certain way, you were kind of stuck with it, and the treatments for learning disorders were all compensations or working around if the problem. If a person, for instance, had uh, an auditory processing problem, you gave them a computer or, or a tape recorder, and it, you never thought of going in there and seeing if you could actually train those areas incrementally to begin processing more normally. It meant that... Um, as you get old, uh, all that we could look forward to was uh, basically, you know, wasting away because we'd accumulate all sorts of problems. And um, of course, look, we all die and eventually we all have problems. But that metaphor led people to sort of think you go into retirement, which is probably the worst thing you can do as you get older if it means understimulating your brain. And because your, your brain is actually more likely to waste away from inactivity than it is to wear out from overactivity if it's not overly stressful. So it had huge consequences for all sorts of clinical problems. It had huge consequences for medication because when you give a person a pain medication, for instance, the brain plastically, neuroplastically responds. So neuroplasticity is that property of the brain that allows it to change its structure and function with activity uh, and that activity can include moving, it can include sensing and perceiving. Really, pretty much anything we do allows a certain degree, not infinite, but a, uh, a, not an infinite degree, but a certain degree of, of, of changing, responding, building up more differentiated brain maps. And that's how we, you know, develop skills. And it seems the, uh, that also, that metaphor with a computer leads us astray because computers can be fixed. There's something that something goes wrong and then you, you, you try and fix them. But it seems like neuroplasticity and the malleability of the brain suggests a different kind of, of intervention to potentially deal with some of the challenges that we know brains go through as they, as they get older. So you, can you kind of describe how we need to think differently about how we intervene as well in potential problems with the brain? Sure. So, you know, I've written two books on brain plasticity, and they looked at the areas um, where interventions are, are possible, feasible, at least for some people, often for a lot of people. And, you know, there, there's, I guess you could divide this into two categories. There's people who, for whatever reason, did not develop a certain area of their brain, Um oh, I don't know, imagine somebody who's born with cerebral palsy and then never gets to move certain th you know, parts of their limbs and so their brain maps don't d even develop in the first place for, for, for movement and even sensation around those movements. And then there are people who've had, uh, or, or learning disorders, and you know, so they never really develop the area. And then there are people who've had injuries. And most of what I focused on were some pretty severe problems and in general, I found that there were a number of areas in which you could intervene. So one of them is, if there's an injury, often a person loses a, a, a mental or cognitive function or ability to move. And we used to think that if, if they've lost that function, that means those cells that subserve that function are dead. And you know now we discover that often they are not dead. They go into a, a, a phase of dormancy. Some of them may be dead, but a lot of them just aren't firing because nothing much is happening when you try to move, when you try to do something and you don't get a result initially. 
And so it's a use it or use it brain and our circuits can kind of turn off. So for those problems, we use various kinds of stimulation in terms of activities. Not, I'm not talking about electrical stimulation, although there are a few instances of, in which you can do that. Um, and then the other thing that starts happening, let's say when there's damage or injury, and you know, that could also be chemical, by the way. It's, it's not just like a head injury where you hit your head against a wall. Um, is cells start firing in the wrong rhythm, too fast, too slow, too irregularly, sort of like a heart arrhythmia. And so you can often um, resynchronize that. And you can often resynchronize it through the senses. That is the you know, fascinating thing. So a brain area could be firing... And you could put input of sounds of a certain rhythm that that would actually travel from the auditory cortex. You know, the you hear it, which is connected to eye tracking and moving and other areas of the brain. We know the auditory cortex is connected to emotional processing. That's why we're so moved by music, for instance. So there, there are many different sensory windows where you can re-regulate the firing of the brain. And I look at a bunch of those. And then the other major thing we do is we can build up brain maps. After there's an injury, or if the brain didn't develop, the map you have of the world outside, or of your limbs even, is poorly differentiated. Think of Columbus's first map of North America. You know, it's sort of the kind of thing you sketch on a napkin versus a Google map, you know, where you have all this fine detail. So you develop exercises to deal with that. So everything I've said is about how plasticity can be used to improve things. But on the other hand, depending on how you use your brain, plasticity can cause all sorts of problems because if you make bad decisions about how you're going to use your brain, you can get set up bad habits, you can block development, and um, you can get addictions, the, a, addiction to a very great degree is a function of the brain plastically responding in a negative way to certain substances. So that's another part of this picture. So the inputs that, if the, if the, if the brain is malleable in that sense um, and can be positively corrected by these kinds of stimuli or these kinds of inputs, then it can also be negatively as well. Exactly. And that, that's a crisis because we're in a 24-7 high input society where the inputs are are coming often in a non-elective way i mean we don't always choose our inputs absolutely and and that's why i'm sort of so excited to talk to you about this because i mean as i said a lot of our discussions around i think the way technologies have been Im embedded or adopted by by society focus on these kind of behavioral outcomes and how they're changing our behavior and potentially changing how we engage as citizens or in our politics or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Um, but increasingly, I would say, in the conversation around children, which is, is where I'd like to start, there seems to be a real growing concern or at least observation from parents and teachers that there's something more going on here. This isn't just sort of behavioral change they're witnessing with their kids, but there seems to be something different about how kids are thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how, how just from a young age would you characterize the, the development of a child's brain being responsive to these kinds of technological stimuli and how they might be changing that development? Well, there's just so many ways in which it's happening. So look, l let me step back and just say, um, you know, we have two hemispheres in our brains and mm. um, the right hemisphere in most people is relatively more involved with a kind of processing that's immersed in the present mm. and is focused on the big picture and on emotions and on reading unique individuals. And the left hemisphere is more focused on abstract maps about these things. And the other thing about the right hemisphere is Let's, let's take language, for instance. It's more focused on the, the musical prosody of the language, whereas the, the other hemisphere is more focused on the sort of dictionary definitions. So in the first couple of years of life, most brain development is actually in the right hemisphere. 
you know, we speak to children in a very musical way. And we sort of coo and sing and speak almost in a baby voice. And it seems that we are, you know, genetically predisposed to do that, to engage them. And we also see a response when we do that. Because that's clearly how their brains are working, right? Exactly. And that, mm -hmm. well, that is what they respond to. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. And so we're building up some really, really important things here. Uh, and it's happening in microseconds. Um, you know, there are people who have actually looked at this scientifically, like if the exchange between a mother and a child. And a lot of it is teaching a child to label emotion. So if you think about a mother breastfeeding an infant, she, you know, the milk goes down the wrong part. So I'm going to assume that more musical prosody. Oh, there, there, sweetheart. Oh, it just went down the wrong passage. You look so upset now here. Let mummy come and help and burp you. You're startled and upset, but it's going to be okay. That's what mothers say all the time. So that's actually a course in learning how to label emotion. It tells the baby there was a cause to it. It mirrors the emotion. She, she sounds concerned and upset as, as she's speaking. She may even say, oh, you look so upset, telling the baby that you are actually broadcasting with your face that there's a problem here. Uh, and then it, it, it tries to say, this won't last forever. It's just an emotion. It'll pass. You will be okay. That's all happening in seconds. If a person has been properly brought up, they don't even have to be, you know, memorize that. They just do it automatically. And that is actually building up the, the ability of the baby to become aware of its own emotion and emotions in others. Now, this is all going to tie into privacy in a second. This is how a self is built up, okay? So then you start playing these games, like it might be peekaboo, and there's a lot of mirroring, you know, and you might smile and then cover your face and then lower, the, lower your hand and go peekaboo, and then the baby does the same thing. More often than not, it's actually the baby that first engages the mother or the parent, and then the mother responds, and then maybe in a game, the baby will turn away, and then they'll both kind of giggle. And, you know, this is the beginning, by the way, this kind of exchange is the kind of infrastructure to developing an awareness that one has a mind. And you, you can't really have a, a much of a self, as we understand it, without understanding that you have a separate mind from another person and a separate point of view on the world. This is all going to be really important in a second when we start talking about teenagers and privacy and, the, and technology. And, you know, the baby also sometimes sees in the peekaboo game that it can't control mom, that she has a will of her own. And at a certain point, toddlers become very aware of their own will. And then at a certain point, there's, they start pointing at things that interest them, right? And what does that involve? Um, it means I'm aware that this is of interest to me, but I want it to be of interest to you. And at some level, again, it's not fully articulated, but you are different than me. You have a different mind. You don't see what I see. Here, see it, and let's enjoy it together. Now, then the child goes off to daycare and comes home, and the parents say, so how was your day? Mm. And it's often like pulling teeth. The child is tired, doesn't want to talk. Yeah. And some think that maybe it's because the child sort of doesn't even understand the question because don't mom and dad know everything about what yeah. my experience is? And at a certain point, they start to realize, actually, they don't. Hmm. Maybe I can use that, yeah. <laughs> you know? And, and that's part of them becoming a self, becoming an individual yes, a separate person one. in the world. Yeah. And then they're, they're often playing and they'll express their fantasy life. That's their conscious and their unconscious emotional preoccupations are played out in these games. Children are kind of spilling all the, their inner psychic contents in this play. And it's, um, it includes their anxieties, their longings, their new mental skills that they're trying to develop. And over time, they... Um, spend a lot of time in reverie, that kind of thought that's on the edge of logic and fantasy and dream. And then at a certain point, they start to keep some of this more private, you know, 
And teenagers often don't want to share with their parents what they're doing. Do you know what I mean? Who they're talking to or what they're doing in the bedroom. And, and you, see, you see more of a kind of guarded privacy start to develop. Before we get too far down the progression, um, in those early stages of brain development, um, what does the introduction of a screen do? How does that input change that process, particularly in those first few years where the brain is, is starting to identify as a, as a self? Um, what does putting an iPad in front of a two-year-old, for example, do? Yeah, I mean, it does a lot of things. Well, first of all, I, I want to just say a couple of things. So just back to the milieu. What, first of all, it's not just in front of the two-year-old. It's also in front of the, the parents. Right. And so many people work at home. And you know, there were studies done that you know, parents who have a telephone, even in the next room, that's on are more preoccupied. So the pr parents get depresented. They're not completely available to the child. And often the parents are so busy and overwhelmed that they, they give this, the child more screen time than they even want to do. But I mean, what you're having here is more of a, a disembodied experience. And in general, of course, they're doing a tremendous amount of watching of prefabricated stories that aren't mm. responding uniquely to where the child is at that moment. So yes, there's tons of information, but they're, they're losing that kind of intimate reading of, you know, the microscopic um, symphony of emotion that they would get if they were with a person who was actually attending to them. That's the first thing. The second thing is all of the, the milieu of the screen is designed to capture your attention and they use all of these tricks that, you know, lead to a spritz of dopamine. And, you know, there's this kind of basic orienting response that we all have, all mammals have, you know, which basically turns our attention in a particular direction. It grabs our attention. Uh, it could be that there's a danger, there could be food, something colorful, exciting, a new mate, and so on. And, you know, the computers are constantly pressing those buttons and to keep the attention held largely for commercial reasons they're doing it you know almost non-stop so that you know attention spans teachers have been noticing this for years it started with television that but i know that as you know when i was a professor i just saw attention spans completely degrade you know people used to be able to read long novels and so, sometimes people in graduate school can't read novels. Oh, I think that's something we all feel intimately. Yeah, absolutely. I feel this intimately. So, I mean, many people have made these observations. So, and I mean, that's just tragic because um, it just means you become a slave to whoever is most able to manipulate your orienting response. And remember, orienting responses have to do with things like survival, sex. Um, so those are very powerful instincts, but if you never get beyond those instincts, there's a whole aspect of life you can't really develop. So, yeah, everything is hypersexualized. Uh, you know, we know that the world of the internet has just unleashed massive amounts of aggression. And that's the milieu in which children are. Now, you could say, as people said when kids started watching more television, oh, but I only let my children watch Sesame Street. And you know, someone like McLuhan was, you know, he had, his major insight was, I mean, he had many insights, but <laughs> one of them that most of the people who study media don't seem to have appreciated is that the medium is the message, meaning even if there are some good things on Sesame Street, that is so mm. outweighed by the damage that's being done by television, which, you know, if you mm. watch, I don't know, CBC or television in the 1950s and in interviews people there'd be like one camera shot and people would be talking to some i don't know someone who was very intelligent in a conversation and now if you watch something like 24 you know the image changes every second sometimes faster than every second and this is this sort of trickles down to children's television too so uh, we're rewiring our attention spans and there's a kind of massive but serious pseudo add uh, I say pseudo because it's not based on any genetic deficiency. It's it's based on uh, 
um, a whole appetitive system as to what we need to sort of keep us awake. I mean, it seems it seems like that that medium versus message thing. I mean, we seem to be wanting to have that may that play that same distinction with various social medias and digital technologies, and that we're starting to. You hear the case often that well, not all screen time is the same. That some time in front of screens for a kid is positive, like maybe going to school in as we all have for the last two years almost virtually versus a video game or a TikTok feed or whatever, which has a different set of stimuli. But it seems seems like you're saying that like that difference might not be as big as we think it is. Well, I mean, you know, there are people. We're herd animals and we have this technology and it's everywhere now and we want to tell ourselves all sorts of stories that couldn't be bad for us. And it's uh, obviously there are genres and subgenres and so on. And occasionally certain good things are happening. Like, you know, you can have like three hour, like whoever would have thought, like, you know, the mainstream media is in free fall in terms of uh, the public's regard for it compared to what it once was. And yet you have young people, like I rem remember I was speaking with a producer, a friend of mine, a television producer, and he was speaking with my son and his girlfriend. And they were talking, it was just around the time of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And, you know, there was a discussion about it. And then my son seemed quite well informed and the producer said, well, where do you get your news? Do you, you know, and they named all of the sort of mainstream media. They said, he said, no, I, I never read that. So that, you know, some people think that's terrible. So how did you find out about all of this? Oh, I listened to a three hour podcast by a soldier who served in Afghanistan and he gave his point of view about it. So there is the birth of this new deep hunger, at least amongst some, for in-depth and this is because it's much cheaper you know you don't need a whole television studio and all of those and advertisers and all that to produce things so yes that's very good but i mean what's happening in the schools is it really deeply disturbing and what's happening when kids become teenagers is very deeply disturbing because they're not completely hatched yet and their brains aren't completely formed and we are herd animals and, you know, another important psychological concept here around the issue of privacy is, you know, and it's both in the Freudian and Jungian streams of psychoanalysis. Jung called it the persona, that we have a mask or that we put on when we assume a role. And we all do this. You know, it, it could be something like aunt, it could be teacher, it could be doctor, whatever. And that's a way of behaving that involves a certain amount of acting and some ritualization and so on. But that's different from our, our private self and our, our deep self. And in the Freudian world, there are problems with false selves and true selves. That's the work of Winnicott and so on. So the pro, you know, one of the problems you get into is once you move into social media, people are putting these, are encouraged to put false selves or personas on and of course they can never negotiate the gap between their persona and who they really are so they're tremendously insecure and it it's a kind of new kind of narcissism it's just remarkable i mean we we seem to th we we've developed this i this conceptualization of social media that it's projecting authenticity when kids are the first people to realize that there's nothing authentic at all about this so they develop all these entire false personas in order to engage in that space so, you know, one of the issues here is the issue of missed opportunities. There are people, I think you have to distinguish between those of us, for instance, of our age, who have had one foot in the digital world and one foot in the, the more literary world, and all of the, um, I don't like the word values, but I'll just say values that go with that. Like, you know, you read books, this is a McLuhan point, and you can sort of follow an argument from, you know, from, from page to page to page. There's a kind of linearity there that's privileged and logic it, it, it is important. How does this compare to that? But when information is coming at you all at once, things like logic are not privileged the way they were. And when kids go through this, they become teenagers. 
and they learn that the way to feel good about yourself is to develop a persona and also show everything good in your life. And then it, that triggers FOMA, fear of missing out in the other kids. And this is so powerful on these kids. Look, they spend time now, instead of being in their room, playing games, reading books, with some exceptions, of course, by playing the, they're involved in this coliseum, really, this virtual coliseum of gladiators, you know, preening and beauty contests and fighting each other. And they've missed a lot of psychological development. What's the importance of privacy? It's in privacy, in those private moments that we herd animals get to step back from the pack and say, well, what do I think about that? Does that feel right to me? Does that measure, you know, what is what he's saying happening? What I'm seeing is it what I'm feeling. So back to plasticity, you know, I've used the word development and I've used the word plasticity. One of the ways to think about what development is, is these various stages of development are the periods of time when the brain is more plastic with respect to those functions. These windows open up of a, for instance, language, right? You, kids at a certain age, you know, are learning multiple words every day, and then you get to be our age, and it's harder. Uh, I mean, unless you're a freak who has an incredible language skill. Um, and all the phases of development, of developing emotional awareness, uh, cognitive development, they all have their developmental windows. And if you don't get some of this when the window is opening, it's, it's, you can get it after. That's what a lot of my work is about, helping people do that. But it's harder. So, and why is privacy so important to that f type of de brain development? Like, why do we need to be doing that without external inputs? Or with, a, with certain kinds of external inputs? And, and why is technology not a, a positive one? input for that. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, Piaget talked about accommodation and assimilation. Like sometimes we adapt to the external environment, sometimes um, by changing it, sometimes we do it by changing ourselves. So if you want a self, if you want an I, that's not just a response to everything around you, but is the birth of an individual with its own, shall we say, role, agenda, goals in life, you must be able to stand back from the crowd and reflect. And you do that in privacy. Yeah, to a certain extent, you could go to a party and have your own private thoughts. That's true. But really, to, to develop a mature, differentiated self, you have to have these moments, you know, walking alone in the shower, unhooked up from 24-7 media. And it's hard always, but if everybody else is making the same mistake because they're all hooked up, then you become a prisoner of the present impulses. So that, I mean, that's why they're so obsessed with identity now, because they actually have identity issues. They have diffused, poorly developed identities when they're already in their 20s. And not everybody always, but a lot do. And then there's people without an identity are very subject to manipulation by others. Um, you know, the whole point, in a way, of John Stuart Mill's understanding of liberal democracy and the importance of free speech and so on. Uh, first of all, if people can't speak freely, they actually can't get a language and they can't even think freely. That's, that's part of a problem. And Tocqueville described the tyranny of the majority. It was, it was a very powerful force in America. Um, and in some ways... I mean, dictatorships can control bits of life, but in a majority, with a majority that's really engaged in an issue, it goes through the entire culture. And so popular opinion can actually be crushing to minorities and crushing to the development of dissenting views. But what Mill thought was the greatest bulwark against the tyranny of the majority in democracies was to have a strong culture protecting the individual. And that meant, put simply, that there are certain areas within society which must be beyond reach of government and even of other people, of the majority. 
these are, this is the private sphere and the private sphere has to be protected to protect the individual and the individual, a, a nation of strong individuals is our best protection ultimately against tyranny. Um, so, you know, we have these Anglo-Saxon habits of, you know, you know, you should mind your own business. Um, not every culture believes in that, but that's part of this whole notion of an individual. So I really do believe this. When there's no privacy, there's no private sphere. You are a step away from a slavish society and tyranny. And people don't understand that today. I, mean, I do wonder as, I mean, <laughs> it seems pretty clear that technologies are beginning to encroach, not just on how we engage with one another in private spaces, um, outside of the public eye, um, or how we might consume media in more private spaces or whatever it might be. Um, but in much more literal ways, I mean, I, I think technologies are encroaching in, are in, have, will have the potential to encroach on how we think. Um, not just how the formation of our thoughts, but actually to, to read our thoughts. Well, of course they do. Um, so, you know, of, of course these companies immediately when they found that, you know, there's a, a rich psychological literature going back about f almost 40 years now of reading facial expression to understand people's emotion. Mm. So, yeah, they've, they've all invested very heavily into this for the purpose of manipulating people. And the surveillance society, you know, has a huge impact on, on self-development. So just knowing that it exists is enough to make you perhaps not want to have certain thoughts because you know the other thing that goes hand in hand with this loss of privacy surveillance society mm. identity politics is virtue signaling and virtue signaling it's part of the same cluster right it's a persona it's saying you know i don't have to do anything to help anybody i just have to virtue signal that i don't like what this person did or I'm for that, and businesses well, it's are not doing just, it. And not just virtual signal in terms of like looking for social recognition, but we know that the power of a surveillance state is if you know you're being watched, your behavior fundamentally changes. Um, yeah, just knowing you're being watched. Yeah, so you can have, you know, and again, another key Freudian concept is here, which is you can have your thoughts at the other end of uh, this conversation um, and I can have my thoughts and I may not say everything I think and feel, and you may not say everything you think and feel. And so therefore the kind of the barrier is somehow or other between us, but you know, Freud showed we have barriers within us. That's the whole point about conscious and unconscious that we can have internal sort of sensors of thoughts that are foreboding. And, um, whenever you know that there is some kind of surveillance going on, whether you believe it's God who will punish you for a bad thought or a government, should they find out you're thinking seditious thoughts or a library that we're creating of surveillance of every possible communication, all of which are considered legitimate now, but five years from now may be considered thought crimes. Do you know, this has a huge impact on people's, over time, self-awareness of who they really are and what they really think. And of course, it leads to utter and almost constant inauthenticity. You know, these problems go back very, very far. You know, in Plato, there was, there's a whole discussion because Socrates has no writings. You know, Plato did all of the writings, but there were discussions about, you know, what are the, the writing in some ways is a problem because the whole idea of a Socratic dialogue was you say different things to different people not simply because of inauthenticity, but certain people are ready or able to hear certain things. And in some ways, that's a kind of depiction of what intimacy is all about. Every grown-up knows you can't always immediately say everything you think and feel to another person. But in writing, if you were to do a treatise, it's like out there and you're saying the same thing to everybody. So the notion of the Socratic... You can see this if you read Plato's Republic, you'll see Socrates will say certain things in the presence of Thrasymachus, who's a sophist, and then other things which are far more revealing 
and penetrating to Glaucon and Adiamantus, two of his younger interlocutors who he thinks show great promise. Um, but now we're in a surveillance society where literally everything we th think is potentially read by people who don't have our best interest at heart. What do you, what do you make of the, um, the desires by two of our biggest industrialists, uh, Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg, to both build devices that read our brains? One is an implant in the case of Musk, and one is sort of a, an external device that can read the mind um, by Zuckerberg. What do you think of that? Well, let's go back to the left and the right hemispheres. So, you know, I saw Musk, you know, and I'm not saying he doesn't have some admirable qualities, but on Saturday night, he, when he did his presentation, he said, I have Asperger's. And there's, within Silicon Valley, there was a lot of asperger -y kinds of behavior. And, you know, this was known years ago um, at MIT, where there were, I'm going to answer your question. Uh, you know, <laughs> there was, there, there were extracurricular courses for the engineers and they i think they called it charm school and it was because they realized that they all had trouble reading emotions in other people and so they wanted to learn about this mysterious thing other people and there's a lot of sort of left brain hypertrophy in the computer world and a lot of um challenges of right brain functions so someone who was like that would actually probably be very drawn to the idea of wouldn't it be neat to read people reverse engineer people but of course this is all monetized and for profit and i mean they're basically we are permitting in our midst the establishment of technologies which are most suitable for one purpose which is totalitarianism which is complete control and of other people who are having sort of thought crimes or feeling crimes and so on and so forth. And uh, we have sci scientists who are trained in some of these things. They didn't invent reading faces. Um, I mean, poets know how, knew how to do that and they could describe it, but what they're, they're mercenaries and they're establishing these technologies, which are already being used in China um, for these purposes. I, I can't help thinking that you're 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 circling back to how we develop as as children and particularly young children, where we learn to engage socially through that kind of personal interaction. And if we take that away um, at that stage, and then try and well, capture, we're vulnerable, th right? Then we 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 th might think we need machines even more to. It might be self reinforcing. I guess is what I'm saying, right? We're creating a vicious circle. Yes. Here. And there's a tribe of people who have no capacity to relate deeply to others who want would want to use these technologies for psychotherapy and so on and so forth. Uh, I have a couple of things I just want to say about that. Um, one of them is, you know, during COVID, which has been deeply traumatic uh, for a lot of children. I mean, eating disorders are through the roof, depression and anxiety. They pick up on all of this. They're masked, so they can't do the facial recognition that's important. Um, if they have any kind of learning disability in terms of decoding speech, now they don't have the visual cues and the speech is muffled. I mean, it's a disaster for kids with learning disorders. I mean, if you want to know what it's like to have a certain kind of learning disorder, put on a mask, put plugs in your ears so you don't hear things clearly, and then speak to people who are, who are like that. Yeah, I, I have an eight-year-old kid, and I find the saddest thing about the pandemic has been watching him go to school with a mask on. It's just, I understand why they're doing it, obviously, but it's like, it's just sad. They've been raised during a combination of a serious event and mass hysteria both at once. And so that's had a bad impact. But um, they've also had more and more screen time during this period. And so you see things like eating disorders go way, way up. Because again, they're looking at themselves on screen. It's all about relating to images. I mean, that's that's the world of you know the pandemic and kids. And as a therapist, you know, I had to go from seeing patients face to face to in the first part of the pandemic seeing them all online. And you know, I've practiced over thirty years, and 
There wasn't a day I didn't look forward to when I got up in the morning to, to go to work. I mean, that's, and you know, I'm a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst, psychotherapist. And then the pandemic hit and so many people were, of course, you know, didn't have work. I was very lucky to have work. And in the first month or so, patients and myself were adapting to doing it online. And for the first time in my life, I found it unbelievably exhausting. And of course, people have talked about Zoom fatigue. And I tried to figure out what was happening because I was one of the first people I had, you know, who had done some telephone therapy. And the telephone I found was much more intimate in a certain sense. People have intimate conversations on telephones with family and friends all the time. It was interesting that the Zoom was so exhausting and, and many therapists reported this. And I tried to understand, well, what, what is it? Now, part of it is your process. Sometimes your patient, if it's on a big screen, is huge and there's a lot of information. Um, some of it may be that they're uncomfortable talking uh, about very private things online because somehow or other it might be hacked. But, you know, there was, there was something missing it was a more cerebral experience and we can't quite put our fingers on it. Do you know, like we think when we see a moving face and we can read, um, nonverbal cues and hear their words that we've got all the information, but I don't think we do. I think science can't measure yet and maybe never will some kind of energetic thing that goes on when two people get in a room. And if you've ever been in the room with a great charismatic politician or you, you know, something happens in the room, do you know? And when you finally see someone, as I got, got to see my daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren after 20 months of not seeing them, do you know, there was something different and that whatever that difficult to measure thing is, which has been lost for children at school for and God knows how it's affected teenagers and young people, you know, when they're desperate to, you know, to have intimate relations. There, there are things that are missing, and it's much more of a left brain experience, I believe. It's not as though I didn't have good psychotherapy sessions. I had some really good ones, but it was much more work to overcome some obstacle that was, that's hard to describe. One of the other things we, we we skipped over quickly in that development process that I'd like to just return to briefly is the notion of addiction and technology. Um, when we think about how we've traditionally defined addiction and its effect on the brain, or like what we mean by addiction when we think about how the brain is responding to certain kinds of stimuli or input, can, can we think of technology as the same kind of addictions we've traditionally thought about it or is it there's something different going on well you know each addiction is slightly different um uh, you know most addictions involve something like dopamine which is one of the brain chemicals that is triggered as we approach or consummating a goal and they they help to focus our attention and they are tied into the reward system so most of the addictions are involve some aspect of that chemistry but there are addictions that involve different chemistries like the opioids but if you think of the exciting addictions they can be based on drugs or they can be gambling um which you know there are these behavioral addictions there can be sex addictions and of course there's a whole issue of porn on the internet we haven't talked about but that is unbelievably addicting um and, you know, that's been shown on brain scans to use, you know, to access the same areas that, you know, gambling and other kinds of addictions and cocaine-like addictions access. But a behavioral addiction can be a serious addiction. I mean, people lose their, their life savings on these things. But are those, but those are behavioral addictions. I mean, you're saying there's a difference between like a physiological addiction or a chemical addiction and a behavioral one. no. I'm saying that in a behavioral addiction, you're often triggering many of the same circuits that are triggered in chemical addictions. Okay. 
so yeah, they're, they're, they're not just bad behaviors, they're brain shapers and they're shaping your circuitry. And that's what we see with te- certain technologies as well. Well, it's, they seem to show all the, the look, whether a per, an individual is addicted or not is a clinical diagnosis. Mm. And it's like, normally it's a clinical diagnosis. It has been for hundreds of years, basically. But do you keep needing the exposure or the activity, even if it's bad for you and causing you harm in other parts of your life? Do you develop tolerance to it? So you need more and more of it, you know? Um, are you preoccupied? Do you crave it? And do you often crave it without even liking it? So, I mean, people who got porn addictions often describe craving it, but not really liking it. Uh, you know, they just had to go and do it. And it's like they're hypnotized or under a spell. But, and a lot of that's with, you see that with the, the same thing with people being online too much. Like they, they kind of know there's a problem. Past a certain age, they know there's a problem. I mean, part of the issue here is a lot of young people have not known nothing else. And, you know, so the idea of going on a camping trip with their parents to a place that's not wired can almost trigger a nervous breakdown in some kids and kids just get batty and almost like they're in withdrawal. If you take away their phones to try to get their attention and so on. So no, these, these are addictions. They're, they're just, we're going through a period where we've kind of normalized it made it necessary for work. And the schools have done a a, a terrible job on this. I mean, instead of schools being a kind of correction, preparing people for the world by allowing them to stand outside all of the stimuli and critically evaluate it. No, they're, they've gone in whole hogs, you know, and they, they want to have more and more screen time. And so they're, all they care about is how many, you know, gigabytes are in the computer or or what's the ram of the computer but the ram and the children is is very minimal their their ability to memorize and keep things in their head is is disappeared and with adults who are now you know looking looking things up you know in real time at the restaurant on google just to return to, to where we started here is the plasticity of the brain um does that indicate that it has been so damaged by these inputs, the inputs of technologies that we fundamentally changed it? Or does it actually mean that if we were to make some behavioral changes and societal changes even, that we could relearn some of the things that have been changed? Do you know what I mean? Like, is it, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get something positive out of this, but uh, it seems to me that that plasticity might actually point to how we can repair what has been damaged. Yeah, you would have to you would have to block these activities for a period of time, but then people would also have to face their deficits. See, development you know development is a movie; it's not a snapshot. So, if all of these activities, which take hours and hours and hours every single day, have created certain tastes, you know, you can acquire tastes. There there are tastes which are sort of natural, like children like when they're born without going to school, they like the sweetness of milk. There are certain and then there are certain tastes you can acquire just by constant learning, you know, like a lot of the bitter tastes or the tastes, you know, of that you get in a fine French restaurant where children go, blah, I don't want to eat liver. And then the adults want their pate. So yes, you can rewire a lot of that. But when you're talking about a civilization that, you know, has generations that have missed out on certain aspects of development that have been part of human history, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years. And and I'm talking about this being very, very present in laying down these emotional things, for instance. Um, You're looking at a somewhat distorted human being, I'm I'm sorry to say, in evolutionary terms. That's not necessarily easy. I think it's what makes it doable? I mean, people have nervous breakdowns because they're so wired in 24 seven. And then every now and then you hear all these uh, meager attempts to deal with these things. Like, well, for instance, you know, people try to go on, you know, these diets, uh, you know, Orthodox Jews have Sabbaths and mm. 
I, I know that they turn off their, you know, their internets and their phones and they have a reset and it's different. And the kids do not watch television, you know, and that. So uh, the Sabbath is a great idea because the other thing about it, and here I am speaking um, maybe a bit more casually than I was about internet addictions, but work can be the biggest addiction in modern life in some ways. And the pandemic has disrupted that for, you know, all these people who don't want to go back to work. Uh, it, it literally took an external event to say, why, you know, why am I doing this? Could I be doing something else? And some of that might be laziness, but some of it actually might be, I've just been going along with the herd and not really thinking through that this is my one life. Yeah, I think it's looking for meaning more than anything else. Yes. Mm -hmm. The pandemic reminded them of their mortality and uh, it, it caused a lot of reflection. And I mean, and then, so, but these kinds of Sabbaths are actually unbelievably important, again, so that you can just have your nervous system come down. But you need a Sabbath in each, you know, during each part of the day as well. And so, how's this? Like, people are often on, in a reverie on the subway. I mean, increasingly, I guess they're listening to their phones. But if people aren't walking to work or driving to work, uh, but they're at their computer now all day because of a home office, we're even more deeply sort of enmeshed in this system. Like, there is, it'll be a, mi a mixed bag if we move more to, you know, this working from home with computers. It's not going to be all positive. On that, I definitely agree. Thanks for taking all this time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That was my conversation with Norman Deutsch. As always, you can reach me at taylor at bigtechpodcast.com. Big Tech is presented by the Center for International Governance Innovation in association with Antica Productions. The show is produced by Trevor Hunsberger, Debbie Pacheco, and Mitchell Stewart, with associate producer Abhi Raheja. Please consider subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We release new episodes on Thursday every week. <laughs>